from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm back in London after what was a fabulous holiday in Uganda. And if you're watching on YouTube, I am wearing the yellow and red shirt of Uganda. I'll just sit up a bit so you can see the name on it. Uh, That was presented to me by the Uganda cricket teams, men's and women's. It was all a rather unplanned visit, but I was there primarily to do some horse riding. Um, Hello to the Bowser family, a wonderful family who put me up, uh, staying with them. And I met a lot of stumped fans, actually, in the course of my week out in Uganda, um, but also managed to get to Murchison Falls National Park, which was a stunning place. Game drives, the most powerful waterfall in the world. The River Nile winds its way through, did some fishing as well. So combined all of my favourite things. Uganda is known as the Pearl of Africa. So I do recommend a visit if you get the chance. Ali, welcome back. Sounds amazing. I'm Brett Sprigg at the ABC in Sydney, where internationally Narendra Modi has been visiting the Indian PM, and it's such a big occasion that they cast the Indian flag onto the sails of the Sydney Opera House. They do this only for special occasions, very special occasions. They didn't do it for the King's coronation recently, which was a divisive matter, but they did this time. Of course, it's all about strengthening ties between Australia and India, but those ties have always been pretty strong on this program, haven't they? I don't know about the cricket field, Brett, but I mean, they were very strong <laughs> otherwise. This is uh, Charu Sharma for Akashwani. I'm in uh, the capital city of the northern state, the most populous state of India, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, the city is Lucknow. Uh, now, of course, a modern metropolis, but otherwise lots of history and heritage, just a wonderful city. I'm here to assist with the opening ceremony of what's called the Kelo India University Games, which is sort of like a national games as India tries to become a, a bigger sporting superpower. So this is, of course, for the university folk. But of course, all eyes on the closing weekend of the IPL and we'll soon have hopefully a new champion but maybe not because all the teams that are likely to go through to the final have been champions before we'll see Ali Dol Uganda sounds such a fabulous visit I'm sorry I can't get up and show any shirt because I don't have a (laughs) Uganda shirt (laughs) but we'll see and you're not wearing a pearl despite despite the fact that you went to the pearl of Africa tell us just a little more will you especially about the cricket there well yeah the cricket side of it actually came about by well the fact that the week before I left I'd said on Stumped how I wouldn't be here next week because I was off to Uganda to ride horses next thing I know I got a DM in my Instagram from uh, Dennis Misali who is the Uganda cricket media manager who is a huge stumped fan. In fact, when I arrived at the ground then and popped in, it turned out I was only staying about 15 minutes from where the national teams train in Kampala. And when I turned up, I then bumped into the team psychologist, Edgar, who's a massive stumped fan as well. And they were only too pleased to show me around the ground. I spoke to the men's, members of the men's and women's team who'd been training there that day. Um, it was, in fact, the, the women's captain, uh, Konsi Oweko, who presented me with this lovely shirt. So we had photographs together. And I learned that there are yeah, four national teams in Uganda, so men's and women's, seniors and under-19s for both. They have got 20 men and 12 women on contracts. Uh, the women are on around 150 to 200 US dollars per month, depending on when they're, whether they're tier one or tier two. Of course, funding is an issue, is a challenge. And yes, we did briefly talk about the ICC's funding model and uh, how much filters down to those uh, associate and affiliate nations. And the ground was one of four in Uganda, in fact, four turf pitches. Although this one in Kampala is is very much multi-use. And I got there just after a big music event had been played on it. So the outfield was perhaps not in its most prime condition. So that is, again, a bit of a challenge when you've got multi-use stadiums like that and it gets hacked up by by all sorts. But um, also kit is a challenge. So there are no cricket equipment stores anywhere in Uganda. So you can imagine the challenges to, you know, where do you get your bats from? Where do you get your pads from? Where do you get your women's specific equipment from? So the team that the country has had in the past, a delivery from, do you remember the charity Bat for a Chance? We had Will Gaffney, uh, who was a schoolboy at the time who'd founded that charity. They had received a delivery from Bat for a Chance. And then here's your Australian connection, Brett. I noticed one of the players wearing a New South Wales cap. And I asked about this, and it turns out that, again, through a personal connection, Bankstown Cricket Club in New South Wales send an annual consignment of kits across to Uganda, which the national teams make use of. 
So that is wow. the cricket fraternity coming together, isn't it? But I'd love to get one of the players on Stumps in the next couple of weeks to tell us more about it from their perspective. But yeah, I learned a lot in my in my short visit. And they're very, very proud of, of the ground that they're called their, their Lords of Uganda in Kampala. Oh, well so yeah, it was a really, really good visit. So thank you to them to make for making me feel very, very welcome. We should get on with the show, shouldn't we? The rest of the show. Uh, we're going to start the week by focusing on a player who is often credited as being the fastest bowler in the women's game. Yes, Shabnim Ishmael finished a 16-year career with 317 international wickets in 241 games across all three formats. She played in four 50-over World Cups and all eight T20 World Cups, reaching three semi-finals and, most memorably, this year's World Cup final in her home country of South Africa. And, Brett, you've been speaking to her. I have, yeah. I love watching her play in the WBBL here in Australia as well at times, and she's such a great fast bowler to watch. I spoke to her and began by asking about why this was the right time for her to retire. So basically it was something I've been thinking about for the past eight months. I've been speaking obviously to CSA. I've been speaking to the psychologist and I've decided like it's, it's a bit too much of cricket, like, you know, playing for South Africa and then traveling in all the other different types of leagues. I mean, also I'm based in Johannesburg for the past seven years and my parents is, well, my whole family is based in Cape Town. So it was a bit difficult, obviously, getting family time and seeing them because I always have to travel. And whenever I see them, I'm always training while I'm there. So it was a bit, it was getting hectic, if I could put it that way. And then obviously the strain on my body, et cetera. So then I've decided to take a, not take a break while I retire from South African cricket and then also still play all the global leagues. We are then still get to see my parents whenever I want, train whenever I need. So I was just obviously taking care of my body and then still playing all the leagues around the world where people can still see me play and obviously play to the best of my potential. So, yeah, that was basically the decision. Looking back on the international side of things, your international career, do you have a favourite highlight? Can you say the World Cup that we just played recently? I think that was the highlight of my career. I think obviously in the semi final playing against England, I think that just took a huge toll. I mean, we played in front of our home ground. I played in front of my family, in front of my friends, fans all around the world, obviously tuned in to watch us. Then obviously ending it there where nobody really knew it was going to be the end of my career. I think that's a memory that's going to be long lasting in a lot of people's, in a lot of people's mind and memory. Do you know then that that was the moment you were going to end your international career with? Actually, um, before the whole, um, World Cup, I actually took a month's break after the WBBL. Took a month's break off from cricket and I actually spoke to the, to the DOC and I told him I actually think this is it. I, I'm, I'm not willing to play for South Africa anymore and I, I spoke to him and he said let's just give it one more try maybe there is still that flame burning in you to play for South Africa so I said no doubt I love playing for my country and obviously my country always comes first and that's always the type of person I am and the type of person I put say on the field my country comes first and the leagues come after whether they pay big money or not and then I took the month's break I had a, um, a few meetings with the DOC with the psychologist helping me through that month when I haven't played cricket because I want to feel what it feels like not to be a cricketer. And I actually enjoy that month taking off cricket and obviously spending time with family, with friends. And I actually enjoyed it. And I said, this is actually the route I want to go. And after speaking to the, the DOC, he told me, just play this last World Cup for us. And I played the World Cup and, and obviously we made it to the final. We made it through the semi-final where we always, whenever we came to a semi-final against England, we always lost. And obviously making that, that history of getting over the semi-final. And I think that was actually the highlight of my career, getting into the final. So from there, everything took a toll. And I told myself, you know what, I spoke to my family. I spoke to, obviously, my close friends and stuff. And I told him, this is actually it. Where I'm just going to, I'm going to retire. I'm going to do it. And to be honest with you, I don't have any regrets as yet. I'm still enjoying my family time, enjoying my downtime. And obviously training when I want and, 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 and so on. So I've been really enjoying it. Beyond that World Cup and the semi and the final, you mentioned that semi-final, that, that fantastic spell you had there, three wickets against England and that 80-mile-per-hour delivery as well. A lot of wickets across your career, plenty of them. Do, can you choose a couple to two or three stand out in your mind? Yeah, 100%. I mean, if I go back, I think it was sometime in 2012 or 13 when uh, it was Sarah Taylor's 100 um, game that she actually played and I got her out. I think it was the second ball, the ball came back into her and it clipped the middle stump and she was really shocked. So I think that was one of the highlights. I've been also saying that I got like, I think three or four or five wickets all that also stands out to me. But I think for me, it's not only about myself, it's more for me, it's about the team environment. As long as the team is doing well, I know that I'm doing well as well. And that's why I always highlight about the past World Cup that we just played. So that was basically the highlight for me, whether I took North wickets or three wickets, I think that is just a standout and a highlight for me. 
you are renowned for your pace. There's no doubt about that. And you've clocked <laughs> 80 miles per hour, which I know was a an ambition of yours. It happened recently at, at the World Cup um, at home. Uh, how did you generate such pace? Especially, I think about you being not the most, I guess, physically imposing figure as we tend to imagine fast bowlers are with their height. I wish I could tell you, honestly, I do everything fast. I drive fast, I eat fast, I sleep fast. <laughs> everything happens quickly. So yeah, basically it's just, that was, it was always a goal and a dream of mine to become one of the quickest bowlers in the world. And I always try to pr- portray that. And obviously in practices, in game situations, but I don't really think about it when I'm obviously out here. I think the adrenaline just pumps me. I just run in and I bowl as fast as I can. But also in saying that, it's when I was younger, it's obviously it was of bowling. I wanted to bowl quick, but now it's more of consistency, knowing how to bowl quick and obviously trying to get more consistent as the, my career went on. So in the past probably five years, I think I've been, past five or three years, I've been really enjoying my cricket, enjoying myself and going out there and just bowling as quick as I can and getting wickets. I'm keen to know, what do you hope your legacy will be as you sort of uh, take your final bow from international cricket? My legacy for me is not always, like I mentioned, I don't like it always to be about myself, but for me it's about the youngsters looking up to me as a professional athlete, not only in my cricketing career, but also in the humanity of part of, of cricket. Like, first of all, we are human beings before we cricketers. So as long as I know I am a human being, I am living a good legacy in the female environment of cricket, I would love for the youngsters to look up to me and say, I want to be a shipman is small one day. So that's basically the legacy I want to leave. It is a time of great transition for South African cricket at the moment. With Lazelle Lee, Dane Van Kirk, uh, Mignon Dupree, all long-time international teammates of yours, having retired uh, around at the same time from international cricket. Where do you think South African cricket is at at the moment? It, it is a bit difficult. I mean, there is lots of youngsters that's pull, pulling through the system, but I still think that they still have a good foundation where they can still both cricketers, young female cricketers, up to actually play for South Africa. So, I mean, yeah, well, if you speak about CSA and where they're at at the moment, I know it is a difficult period for them, but I still feel that they also still have a good bunch of players where they can still nurture them and make sure that when it comes to the next three years, they can probably win the World Cup. Well, Shabnam, from all of us, congratulations on your international career. It's been one you should be extremely proud of, and we appreciate your time having a chat to us on Stumped. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So that's Shabnam Ishmael speaking to Brett Sprigg and she's always got plenty to say on the game. We wish her well in her retirement. Well, next on Stumps, we are nearing the end of the 16th edition of the Indian Premier League. The 2023 season seen a stack of records be broken. We've had the most sixes and the most centuries in a single season, the most runs by an uncapped batter in a season and the most totals of 200 plus. Now, we already know that MS Dhoni's Chennai Super Kings are through to what is their 10th final in 14 seasons after beating defending champions Gujarat Titans. Uh, The Titans, they will still have a crack at getting to the final. Uh, They will play Mumbai Indians in the Eliminator on Friday. Charu, what of CSK then? They've won the title four times. So how have you rated them over the course of the competition this year? No, it's a little strange that they've made it so quickly through to the final because they had a sort of an up and down, choppy season to begin with. And uh, a lot of them were, a lot of the fans were happy to kind of write them off in terms of a title. But haven't they come back magnificently? Uh, Dhoni himself, being their talisman, of course, hasn't done too much individually. But every time he walks onto the field, a million fans add on because that's his charm and and that's what he brings to the game. Uh, Hasn't done much individually, but... Everyone now is, of course, applauding uh, his his captaincy because they all mentioned that maybe there's an X factor there and it's because of how he has held on to the team and, and the team's largely gone unchanged. And there are all sorts of facts and figures about how Chennai Super Kings have had the least team changes. I think they've had the same team for like seven matches or whatever, despite the fact that many of the players were not doing too well. But, you know, who knows what this X factor is because they certainly, I must say, did not look like the strongest team course, against uh, Gujar Titans in that uh, first qualifier, they played really well. They were on home turf, though. And uh, I think it's a known fact that many teams are, but certainly CSK are very, very strong. That Chepok is like a fort, fortress. And uh, they've surprised me, frankly. Uh, they've somehow looked a little vulnerable all the way through. And then here we are, the first team to make the final. And who knows, they might even win an equal Mumbai in terms of the number of wins. But, yeah, so it's been a surprising season. I didn't think they were good enough for the top, but here we are. I mean, who knows about T20 cricket, right? <laughs> I mean, Dhoni's captaincy, Brett, I mean, he'll always be asked, how long are you carrying on for? Are you going to stay as captain? And he seems very unwilling at the moment to sort of say either way, which is his prerogative, isn't it? 
I mean, you speak about the value of, of great leaders and the fact that uh, you have a guy who people just walk a little taller behind, even if they're not the one always leading with, with, with bat or ball. They've just got this certain presence about them. MS has had that for so long in India, hasn't he? At international level and now at, at franchise level. And that's, I suppose, speaks to his quality, Sharo, is all I would say about that. Yeah, because, you know, captaincy is a strange thing in T20 cricket because the match goes by so quickly and all the best laid plans are, you know, often trashed because of what goes on in the field. So I just think there's a certain calmness, and, which has been storied, of course, and, and perhaps a, a sunny personality that doesn't quite consider uh, himself to be above anybody else. He's very much one of the lads. And, of course, his age now and everything that he's proved so far Obviously, there's uh, an enormous respect that's automatically uh, granted to Dhoni, so he doesn't really have to kind of boss it over anyone. And I must also uh, put a little tick mark for the franchise itself, because it's run by Mr. Srinivasan, who, of course, was the chief of Indian cricket for very long. He's been running cricket in Chennai and, well, other parts of India for, what, over 50 years. So I think there's a certain calm in that franchise where they don't really... I'm not saying care, that's the wrong word, but they're not overly concerned about victories and losses. And maybe that attitude passes on to the players as well. And they somehow keep the pressure, the excess pressure away from performance. Because often, as we know, uh, when the stakes are very high, it's those who can't handle pressure very well. It's a strange word in the world of sport, right? Um, they, Chennai seem to be the calmest team. And strangely, that leads to winning, regardless of whether they have the best team or the best combination or not. Yeah, you rarely see Dhoni remonstrate with players on, on the field. Like, he'll just say to them all, you, you just need to watch me, because he will tinker every ball he might make a field change. He just needs his players, he says, to watch him at all times. You know, if they put a catch down, you know, that sort of thing happens. So that's his sort of calmness he brings with it. Well, I, I must say, if you notice carefully, he does sort of, Purse his lips and kind of you know puts on a, 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 a. I mean, you can make out when he's upset, but he tries very hard not to show yeah, just, it. Just contain in a peculiar way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, um, what about Shubnam Gill? Because uh, the Gujarat Titans opener has clocked up 700 runs in this year's competition. I mean, he's had a remarkable year, hasn't he? 2023, the youngest double centurion in One Day Internationals and India's highest centurion in T20 internationals. I mean, his star is rising and rising, Charu, isn't it? He is just magnificent to watch. And whether he gets those 700 runs or only seven, every run is like a peach. Just the way he scores, his balance on the crease, and particularly that rock-solid head is just a pleasure to watch. And of course, when he does get big runs, you feel it's natural because he's, you know, he's just so contained and controlled. And yet he scores pretty quickly. That uh, strike rate is almost 200 or in the 170s or so. So, yeah, I mean, I I'm so glad for him because he was also a wonderful young man. Yes, clearly the biggest thing to come out of this IPL, not that he wasn't uh, playing for India before that, but I, I think his, his young career has been so far a little checkered. But after this IPL, I think he will gather not only himself, but his fans, a lot of belief. And I say once again, such a joy to watch because most of what he plays are typically classic shots. He's not a big slogger. Oh, I mean, I can go on about him, but I'm so glad for him because he's also, as I said, a nice man who has a nice steady head on his shoulders. That is all we've got time for on this week's Stump. So I'll say thank you to Brett Sprigg and Charis Sharma and of course to all of you. And we'll see you again next week. Until then, bye-bye.